Good morning. Good morning. It is 10.30ish. So welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Davis. It is Sunday morning, and we have Julie Bells today. Woohoo! We have Linda Burse is our director, and Curia Boundy Mills, who is back from a big day yesterday from her yeast collection that was on um, display at UCD. And so that was a big day for her. So thanks for coming. So. Uh, Julie Bells will be playing early one morning, and again, we would love for you just to sit back and relax and center, and if you have any conversations, it would be a great idea to take them in the social hall so we can all enjoy the music. Good morning. Welcome to the UU Church of Davis. My name is Steve Burns and I'm a member of your board of trustees. For thousands of years, the land upon which we are gathered has been the home of the Putwin people, including the Yocha Dehi Winton Nation today. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be gathered here today on their traditional lands. If this is your first time in person, we welcome you. We hope you will stop by the welcome table so that we can get to know you and you, get you connected. For our online community, if this is your first time here or you're not yet connected to our newsletter, please look for a message from our online welcome host or send a message to the person with welcome in their name. We come together in many ways this morning. Let us take a moment to connect to our online congregation. However you are joining us this morning, please leave the door open behind you, inviting others to enter too. We light our chalice, the chosen symbol of our faith, and Cliff will be our chalice lighter today, with these words by Nathan Ryan. Be it real or metaphor, whatever is in your backpack or your briefcase or your purse that you've brought into the sanctuary that is weighing you down, leave it behind. Whatever you are carrying that is keeping you distracted or caught up in shame or guilt or hopelessness, leave it behind. If you need it, it will be there when we're done, but for this hour, just let it go. Come into this place with open hearts. Come into this place with a soul that has, been, that has remembered how to be tender again. Come into this place with a renewed hope for this world. Come into this place ready to build a world we've always been worthy of 
and have always dreamed of. Please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, 1060, as we sing of hope and joy. With Valentine's Day just a few days away, I wanted to have a story today about love and belonging and sharing and community. And I looked at a bunch of books and a bunch of different stories. And in the end, I found this video that comes from the South Church Unitarian Universalist in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This is something that their youth did on Valentine's Day in 2021. Enjoy. Hi, and happy Valentine's Day. Like it is with other holidays, people who celebrate Valentine's Day do it in different ways and even for different reasons. What I really appreciate about this day is that I think of it as a day that reminds us to tell people that we love them. Sometimes we can forget to say or show that we love each other, but this is a day specifically meant for showing love. Of course, I want to be practicing all day, every day, and that's really hard. So I'm happy to have this day to remind me. It's easy to think about the people who we love, like maybe parents and grandparents and friends and our pets. But what if we wanted to grow our love? We could think about the story we heard last week where the kids were dropping a stone in the water and it made larger and larger ripples moving outward. Do you remember that? The teacher in that book said that kindness is like that. And we can also think about growing our love like that too. We could grow beyond boundaries like the ripples. What would those ripples be? I invited some South Church kids to help demonstrate this with cookies because most people understand the language of cookies. 
And because we're talking about love and Valentine's Day, we used bigger and bigger hearts for the ripples. So let's watch and we'll start with the smallest heart and see how we can grow our love to include more and more people in our hearts. This is the smallest ripple. This might represent our family. Leo is the next ripple out. It could represent our close friends or our extended family. This ripple is a little bit bigger than the other two. It could represent the people in our church. This heart might represent people in our neighborhoods or schools. This heart might represent the people in our town or city. Wow, that is some beautiful and delicious love. So the process of creating beloved community means we try to grow our hearts bigger and bigger to be able to hold the people that we don't know really well and the people who are different from us. We won't stop until we hold love for all people and all beings in the whole earth. Our heart is a muscle. And the more a muscle gets used, the bigger and stronger it gets. Sometimes we make a wrong move and we injure a muscle and then it's important to do what we need to to heal it. And then we get back to using and strengthening that muscle. And that's how love works. The more we practice loving, the bigger and stronger our hearts become. And sometimes our hearts hurt and we need to take care and heal. And then we continue growing our love. One of the kids that helped with the cookies said it reminded them of the Grinch when the Grinch's heart grew three sizes. And that's right. That's what it's like. And if the Grinch can do it, then we can too. I love you and I hope to see you soon. In honor of our joys and sorrows, I offer you this meditation by Alice Anacheka Naisman. In a world so filled with brokenness and sorrow, it would be easy to lose ourselves in never-ending grief, to be choked by our outrage, to be paralyzed by the enormity of suffering to feel our hearts squeeze tight with hopelessness. Instead, this morning, let us simply breathe together as we hold our hearts open. Breathing in as our hearts fill with compassion, breathing out as we pray for healing in our world and in our lives. Breathing in, opening ourselves to the transforming power of love. Breathing out as we pray for peace in our world and in our lives. 
breathing in as we hold hope in our hearts, breathing out as we pray for justice in our world and in our lives. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us into this world. Breathing in, we are the prayer. Breathing out, we are the healing. Breathing in, we are the love. Breathing out, we are the peace. Breathing in, we are the hope. Breathing out, we are the justice. May we know our strength. May we be filled with courage. May our love flow from us into this world. Amen. Blessed be, and may it ever be so. Please join me now in a moment of silent meditation, reflection, or prayer, after which we will sing, There is More Love Somewhere.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alex Lee Job, and I've been a member of this church about 30 years. And I'm here to talk about drum. Diverse, revolutionary, Unitarian, Universalist, Multicultural Ministries. And I want to tell you that I'm a complex person. I'm complicated. I'm sure you are too. <laughs> An example is my clothing today. On my feet, I've got rainbow clogs. <laughs> On my chest, I've got Year of the Dragon Chinese New Year t-shirt. And I want to tell you, I would not be a member of this church without drum. When I am with BIPOC, means Black Indigenous People of Color, you use at a drum gathering, I feel a comfort that I don't feel anywhere else. I love this church. It and you have been there for me in many ways I deeply appreciate. When my son died, you were there for me in so many different ways. When you voted to erect the Black Lives Matter banner, you were, we were there for each other. And when we've account, attended countless vigils and rallies together in community, we've supported important causes. Thank you. At many drum gatherings, I hear of racial incidents that cause BIPOC you use to wonder if they're welcome in this faith. I've heard it said that they love the faith and the ideals it stands for, but they just cannot continue to be hurt by white supremacist treatment, too many micro and macro aggressions. I've heard congregants ask, why don't more BIPOC people come to our church? So I ask you, what have you done to educate yourself to welcome them? I, they often feel that there's no one to support them, to truly see them for who they are. Some have left the church and faith. I need a space that sees, honors, and supports me. When you contribute to DRUM, you support me and other BIPOC you use that are experiencing challenges in their faith and in their church. So thank you.
I'd like to open with a reading from Braver Wiser, a weekly message of courage and compassion available at UUA.org. Choosing to Connect by Priscilla Shumway. When we acknowledge that all life is sacred and that each act is an act of choice and therefore sacred, then life is a sacred dance lived continuously each moment. When we live at this level, we participate in the creation of a better world. Scott Cloud Lee. Every Saturday morning, my husband and I rise early and head off to volunteer at our local food bank. The food bank is supported by people from 28 different congregations, including our Unitarian Church. After we set up, volunteers gather as our director reads a Bible passage and a prayer. As a UU and atheist, these prayers initially caused me discomfort. As I stood listening, all I heard were the things that I did not agree with. But by focusing on the things I disagreed with, I created a sense of separation of judgment between me and the others. Over two years, as my relationship with the other volunteers and the mission of the outreach has deepened, there has been a change in my relationship to these prayers. Now, during the prayer, I hear sentiments I agree with rather than those I disagree with. I agree that we all give our time, talent, and treasure to do this work that the work we do is important in the lives of our clients, that we who volunteer feel called to do this work. But who or what is calling us? This is where the prayers and I diverge. The prayers suggest that we are called to do this work because God directs our life and calls us to it. But as an atheist, I feel called to do this work because of my belief that every act and choice I make can create a better world. While I may have little control over the larger world, I can help create a better world in my own neighborhood, one client, one connection at a time. Now, as I pray with my friends, I feel a deep sense of connection to them and the sacredness of this work we all feel called to do. I realize it is my actions and choices that determine my connection to others. Now, it no longer matters to me who or what is calling each of us, only that we show up in love and faith to do the work of creating a better world. I once heard, probably in seminary, that preachers often preach the sermon they themselves need to hear. I don't know how true this is for my colleagues, especially those who preach on a weekly basis, but lately I've been feeling like it really does apply to me. Unlike my colleagues who preach almost every week, I rarely need to come up with more than two or three sermons a year, which means I can choose topics that really interest me. What interests me now, and the topic of the last few sermons I've preached, is nothing less than the future of congregations, especially small Unitarian Universalist congregations. As someone who works almost exclusively with small UU congregations, their future, perhaps your congregation's future, is inextricably linked to my future. And I hope that by preaching sermons I need to hear means I might be preaching a sermon that you need to hear too. So, 
Here's what's been on my mind and in my heart lately as we find ourselves in another church year, that long stretch of time between September and June when congregations are traditionally the most active. I've heard from some of my fellow religious professionals who've made it through the last two pandemic fraught years that preparing for this year felt a little like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or fiddling while Rome is burning. I get that. Who among us isn't exhausted? I know I am. The things that helped me get through 2020 didn't work in 2021, and the strategies that made 2021 manageable weren't enough for 2022. And now I have to ask myself, what's left to get me through to 2023? Even more troubling, there's a part of me wondering, is it even worth it? Now, I'm a bit of an optimist. I tend to thrive on situations that offer opportunities to try something new. And if there's anything positive one could say about the pandemic, it has definitely been an opportunity to try new things. If the effect of COVID-19 on our society was the only thing we had to deal with right now, I probably would be able to manage but it's more than COVID-19, isn't it? There are just so many heartbreaking things in our world today, I, I hesitate to even enumerate them. Unprecedented weather extremes caused by climate change, the embrace of fascism and authoritarianism by many of our fellow citizens, threats to democracy at home and around the world, the ongoing racial and economic injustice that has tainted our society from its beginnings, increased religious intolerance masquerading as freedom of belief and attacks on reproductive justice and LGBTQ rights. It's enough to make even an optimist like me ask, why bother? Maybe we are just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and fiddling while Rome is burning. So when I found myself giving in to this state of despondency, I searched the web to see if there was anything out there that could bring me a glimmer of hope. And I'm not just talking about some internet meme. I'm talking about something substantial, something that could make me really believe that it is indeed worth it. What I found are these words from Howard Zinn, the historian, playwright, philosopher, and socialist thinker who wrote A People's History of the United States. In his 2002 autobiography, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train, Zinn wrote, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently. This gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however a small way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, 
is, in itself, a marvelous victory. When I first read this passage, I could almost feel the sense of hopelessness beginning to fade. These words are indeed substantial, far beyond some overly simplified internet meme. I found it especially encouraging that as a historian, Zinn asserts that being hopeful in hard times is based on a fact, that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. Now, Zinn's emphasis on human history reminded me of something else from my seminary days, the work of Unitarian theologian Henry Nelson Wyman. Before I go further, I need to say a couple of things. One, while I feel comfortable thinking theologically, that is, occasionally using the concept of God as one possible way of examining a situation, as in, where is God in this? I'm not necessarily fluent in the language of theology, which is to say, I found myself on more than one occasion reading an impenetrable passage from some theological text over and over again, only to find myself with no idea what the writer was talking about. And two, content warning, I am going to be using the word God a few more times in the sermon. But know that I do so as somebody who is primarily an atheist. But as I said, I'm okay using the concept of God to explore a subject, especially if the person I'm engaged with, Henry Nelson Wyman, in this case, is using it. Creativity is at the heart of Wyman's theology. He defines God as the creative event that works through human history. God as creative event is that process of reorganization which generates new meanings, integrates them with the old, and endows each event as it occurs with a wider range of reference. By the way, that's from Martin Luther King Jr.'s doctoral dissertation, a comparison of the conceptions of God in the thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. King notes that while the creative event has a unitary character, it is made up of four sub-events. Emerging awareness of qualitative meaning through communication with other persons, integrating new meanings with ones previously acquired, expanding and enriching the appreciable world by a new structure of interrelatedness and a widening and deepening of community. This is what excites me about Wyman's notion of the creative event. These four sub-events together can set in motion a range of possibilities, up to and including the creation of a better world. But in order to access this creative event, we need to be open to whatever those possibilities might be. And we do that through what Wyman called creative interchange. According to Professor Marvin C. Shaw, creative interchange is a certain kind of communication. It begins in the candid expression of one's unique personal perspective, and thus goes beyond the superficiality of much conversation. This Perspective must be expressed without the desire to impress or to manipulate the other so that it does not elicit a defensive or rejecting response. The one who hears must be free of self-preoccupation and not project feelings or interpretations onto what is said. If, in addition, the hearer does not cling to the present state of the self but is open to change, the new insight can be integrated, perhaps with modifications, into the mind 
And this addition of a new perspective or pattern of interpretation enlarges the mind and increases what, is, what it is able to feel and know. Since the speaker and the hearer now share something of each other, further creative interchange may occur more readily. Learning about creative interchange while I was in seminary had a huge impact on me, and it's been the motivation for most of the continuing education I've done since then. It's why I've participated in multiple circle process trainings, and it's why I became certified as a spiritual director. I truly do believe that when we express ourselves without the desire to impress or to manipulate the other, when we no longer cling to our present state but open ourselves to change, the appreciable world is expanded and enriched, and we become more capable of kindness and courage, compassion and sacrifice. And this is the possibility which gives me hope that our congregations, no matter what size they may be, can help us access the creative event Wyman calls God. Give us the energy to act, to live as we think human beings should live, and in the face of all that is heartbreaking in this world, behave magnificently. As Priscilla Shumway shared in Choosing to Connect, we need to move beyond a sense of separation, of judgment between ourselves and others, and learn to hear the statements we agree with rather than those we disagree with. Both Shumway and Zinn would agree that in this infinite succession of presence, we can, with every act and choice we make, create a better world. What better place than a religious community to choose to go beyond the superficiality of much conversation and be truly present for one another, to listen to each other free of self-preoccupation and not project feelings or interpretations onto what is said. This is how we practice creative interchange. And by practicing creative interchange, we invite all the potential of the creative event into our lives. And by inviting the creative event into our lives, we widen and deepen our community and increase the possibility of together sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. It isn't necessarily easy, though. The creative event starts with communication, but in this hyper-connected world where both information and disinformation are as close as the nearest device with internet connectivity, moments of creative interchange of interpersonal connectivity are hard to come by. That's why I'm such an advocate for what Kay Lindahl calls the sacred art of listening, which happens to be the title of one of her books. Lindahl notes that listening is not a passive activity. It's not about being quiet or even hearing the words. It is an action and it takes energy to listen. Listening is something we need to practice like a spiritual practice. It shouldn't be surprising that the title of another one of Lindahl's books is Practicing the Sacred Art of Listening. Here are three daily practices that Lindahl suggests. One, silence. Spend at least one minute each day. Use intention to listen for God, source, wisdom. Two, reflection. Take a deep breath before you respond. Listen to your soul. Get to know yourself. Three, presence. Be mindful of each moment. Pay attention. Be with the person you are with. If you would indulge me, I'd like for us to try the first practice together. Let's spend a minute or so right now in silence. Find a, uh, find a position that's comfortable for you. Close your eyes if you'd like. Notice the space around you. Feel how you are inextricably connected to the earth directly beneath your body. Be aware of what it's like to be present in this moment and listen.
Thank you. Lindahl has some other suggestions for practicing the sacred art of listening. Notice when you choose to listen and when you choose not to listen. Notice what it's like to give the gift of listening to someone else and what it's like to receive it. Notice when you experience the art of listening, being a listening presence with another. Notice when you start to interrupt someone and what happens when you don't. Notice what happens when you stop speaking and you ask, is there anything else? Notice what happens when you let go of your agenda to be present with another. Finding Zinn's quote helped me be more hopeful about the possibilities ahead of us. And it taught me that being hopeful is not foolishly romantic. This hope is reinforced by the belief that our congregations can be places where we together can learn to communicate with each other in such a way that creative interchange occurs, that it gives us the energy to act, and that together we can live now as we think human beings should live. In closing, I'd like to share the prayer Priscilla Shumway used to close her Braver, Wiser reflection. May we continue to become more mindful of that which connects us rather than that which separates us. May we always remember that the acts and choices we make are sacred as we work to create a better world. If you'd like to rise in body or spirit and or spirit, let's see him 128 for all that is our life. <laughs> session 15 minutes after the service ends that will be over in the library and there will be a benediction following the extinguish the chalice so we extinguish our chalice by reading together these words by elizabeth sell jones we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community or the fire of commitment these we carry in our hearts until we are together again Our closing words are from the Reverend Dr. Lindsay Bates, Minister Emerita of the UU Society of Geneva, Illinois. The Quakers speak not of a worship service, but of their meeting. 
hence this benediction. With faith in the creative powers of life, with hope for the future of life in this world, with love for all others who share this life with us, let us go forward together in peace. Our meeting has ended. Let our service begin. Go in peace, my friends. I'll see you next week.